Hello everyone and welcome to the first video on my new layout canal sidings. This is my first YouTube video so please bear with me while I learn how to get it right. Canal sidings is a small layout, some six feet by two feet, and was built out of a need of mine to uh, generate a shunting layout. My main layout, which goes all around my room, represents a fictitious part of the West Coast Main Line, and it has no goods handling facilities at all, although I can run good long freight trains. So I decided, spurred on by seeing many layouts on the modelling press in small spaces that are just for shunting and I decided to build something myself. I've been building it for about six months and this is my progress so far. I have actually been doing other things more than what you can see and I'll talk about those a little bit later. The layout is based on a fictitious freight yard somewhere in ex Lancashire and Yorkshire territory and will actually have a Lancashire and Yorkshire warehouse or goods handling facility shall we say at the end where you're looking now and the two tracks sort of right of centre in this picture go into that warehouse. The baseboards are built from mostly MDF the tops are 6mm and the sides are built from 4mm MDF with some 19 by 19 wood in between as you can see around that area where you can see they're built like girders. The baseboard most of the time covers the top of that up. The back scenes are an integral part of the construction and give the railway quite a lot of strength. The front girders obviously are the same but don't come up above the baseboard level. The cutout down here is for the canal which helps to give the layout its, its name and the fiddle yard which is an integral part of the layout, it's not an extra, doesn't add any size to it, is made up of this sector plate and a couple of sidings along the back there. All of that will be hidden and there will be a back scene across here which will also run down there um, and there will be a warehouse here serving the, being served by and serving the canal and there will be factories and warehouses all the way along the back um, and all the way across this end. At this end here, there will also be a bridge going across which will create the scenic break. But I didn't want a wide bridge. I didn't want a bridge that was really wide here because it might overpower the scene. So I decided to make it a disused railway, which means it only needs to be just a bit wider than one track. And there will be a track on it and it will come to an end and there will be a ballasted section with no track in it. And I ultimately intend to put onto that a series of crippled and waiting demolition wagons. Um, but that will be a long time before I start to build those I should think. The layout is built to 4mm scale double O track. And the plain track is SMP using code 80 rail. All the points are handmade by me using code 80 rail and um, copper clad sleepers. The point work is actually built not to OO normal standards but to a standard called OOSF or 4SF. Now this is a standard that was invented sometime in the distant past um, and stems from a, need, a requirement to try and improve the look of double O track um, and in particular to reduce the flangeway gaps and the crossingway gaps. If we just zoom in here 
what we mean is these are the flangeway gaps this one this one between the check rail and the stock rail and between the wing rail and the crossing V and the flangeway gap is this one where the rail actually is discontinuous as the wheels pass over it and what 4SF does is actually reduce the track gauge through the point work and if you wish everywhere I only do it through the point work to 16.2 millimeter gauge rather than 16.5 this allows for a 1 millimeter flangeway and a smaller crossing V gap um, if you want to know more about 4SF just go to the 4SF website um, which I can't remember what it is but I'll try and put a link at the bottom of the page The track work was designed in a program um, called Templot, T-E-M-P-L-O-T. -E I'll try and put a link to that uh, at the bottom of the video screen as well. Um, and this allows you to design track work to prototype standards in any scale and gauge and to then print out that track work actual size for your model railway to make templates on which you can build the track work. I built all this track away from the baseboard totally relying on Templot's accuracy. When I came back to the baseboard I fitted it to the baseboard and it was perfect the first time. Um, all I had to do was ensure that I'd got all the gaps between the uh, the sleepers at the joins between the sections right and it all sat perfectly it's actually built in four sections um, one section goes from here to here I think that's in the video um, which contains two points and the diamond crossover uh, another section was this point here up to about here and down to the traverser and then another section was these two points, this one and this one. And finally the crossover, which is probably just out of shot, right up at the top of the screen. Um, as I say, they were built away from the track, away from the baseboards, and then introduced, and um, it worked perfectly. The ballast is Carr's firebox ash. I think can't find the pot. Here it is. Yep. Car's firebox ash. Um, and the track was laid on a, a type of PVA and instantly ballasted. The ballast was left to sink into the PVA for about 10 minutes. The track was weighted down. Then the excess ballast was vacuumed off and the track was weighted down again and when the PVA had dried the result is what I've got here um, of course being careful not to get PVA in the point work in the around the stretcher bar or tie bar as modelers often call it um, the points are actually controlled by servos all you see is a little pin sticking out of the board just like you would if you used um, seep point motors or pico point motors but these are model aircraft servos they cost between two and three pounds each depending on where you buy them um, and they are mounted on 3d printed brackets under the baseboard and driven by servo controller boards um, which I get from an organization that I belong to known as Merg which is Model Electronic Railway Group um, who can offer you lots and lots of electronics for your model railway and lots of information about how electronics works and how to use it. Uh, if you're interested go to their website which is merg.org.uk and if, you're in, if you like us join us. I'll talk a little more about Merg when I talk about control systems. The layout control consists of three separate pieces with which we can control track power and hence locomotives 
all of the accessories and we can position the sector plate without having to peer over the top of the layout. DCC control is via an NCE power cap and this controls only the locos i.e. just the track power, nothing else. For all control other than the track power this is the control panel and this control panel relies heavily on Merg electronics particularly on the CBUS system and if you go to the Merg website merg.org.uk you will be able to find out lots about the CBUS system and don't forget to download Davy Dick's really excellent book on electronics for model railways. It's free even to non-members and it's got a really good section in it on CBUS. As you can see we use a mimic panel and the points are controlled by the switches shown in the positions that they, are, that they occupy. So if I flick that one you can hear a point change flick it back and the point changes back again. Um, we have occupancy indicators for tracks that have trains on them, or should I say locos on them. And there are a lot of other switches up the back here for accessory uh, operation, like the layout lighting, the building lighting, um, and a few other things which I'll leave to your imagination for now. The third item of control equipment is actually just a 7 inch monitor which looks at, at the moment, two, but eventually three cameras that will be mounted on the bridge at the end of the sector plate. I have a switch on the front of the monitor that allows me to switch between two of the cameras. Eventually I'm going to have another switch on the control panel somewhere over this side, which will allow me to select the third camera as well. That just allows me to see how things are aligned. So if I operate you can see the relative speeds and if I come back this way you'll see that I can align quite nicely with the fast and slow speeds. And lastly, in case you were wondering about this little chap this is Huey, known as Huey because his registration number is HUE166. He's apparently a very famous Land Rover, but not being a Land Rover geek I wouldn't know. But I include him because a friend of mine who will almost certainly watch this video will be asking me afterwards, where's Huey? So Len, this is for you. Okay, that's all I've got to say on canal sidings. For this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it hasn't been too much of a mess and uh, if you like it then please subscribe and give me a like. Any more questions ask me. If there's anything else you'd like to know ask me um, and hopefully in a month or so I'll do another video and expect Huey to turn up in that as well. Bye for now everybody.